This is Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where every single week we explore the people, the places, and the history of West Tennessee. I'm so excited to have Paula Casey with us today. She's going to talk to us all about the 19th Amendment. She literally published the book and has been working on this um, for literally decades. So welcome, Paula. Thank you. So before we jump into talking about the 19th Amendment and history um, and some of the people that uh, helped the 19th Amendment uh, uh, get passed, tell us a little bit about you. I know, uh, I believe you're from Nashville, is that right? Yeah, I grew up in Nashville, graduated from DuPont High School in Nashville, went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, go Lady Dolls. I was up there when Pat Head later Summit was hired. And at the University of Tennessee, I met a lot of wonderful people, and I really became interested in a lot of the history. I took a lot of women's studies courses back then before it was considered a major or a minor, and I also had a good buddy in Bill Haltham who was from Memphis, and he and his later wife, Claudia Swafford Haltham, have always been great friends. So I was in the newspaper business for 10 years, and... My husband died in 1988, and my friend Carolyn Yellen, who was so wonderful, had written an article in the December 1978 edition of American Heritage Magazine, and it was the second longest article ever published. It was called Countdown in Tennessee, and she wanted to do a book. So I, of course, being a graduate of the University of Tennessee, just knew that UT Press was going to want to do this book. So I called to see if we could submit a book proposal. And I was told, oh, we've already done a book on women's suffrage. And I was stunned. And of course, later it occurred to me, I should have said, nobody ever says that about the Civil War. But I didn't think about it at the time. So anyway, we ended up finally getting the book published. And actually, in 1989, Carolyn Yellen and I decided to do a video. So we wanted to tell the 72-year history of women struggling to win the right to vote. Nobody gave it to them. So I get sick of hearing this, oh, American women were given the right to vote in 1920 as though it were bestowed by some benevolent entity. These women fought for 72 years to win the right to vote and be included in the Constitution. So that really became my area of interest. And I've spent over 30 years trying to educate the public about Tennessee's pivotal role. And now here we are in 2020, 100 years later. It's, it's got to be exciting for you to have begun this work so long ago and to now have us be at a pivotal moment where we're going to be focusing on this. And you really are the expert on this particular topic. In a lot of ways, you're like those women who fought so hard for the right to vote. Well, thank you. I've um, been very fortunate to have great friends and, and historians. Tell us a little. I know there's a variety of ways um, and things that you've been working on. Did, you, were, you mentioned the book. Uh, did you guys actually have a publisher for that, or did you end up self-publishing? Well... That's a kind of a complicated story. Let us just say it has been for different incarnations. Okay. Back in the 90s, you've got to remember, publishing is a totally different animal, how it has evolved. So we had some difficulties, and it ended up, thanks to the Library of Congress, that I was able to change the publisher, and then I ended up becoming the actual publisher because we wanted to do the ebook and audio book in 2013. And my primary market is libraries, although we do sell a lot of different places. And we have all that information on the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Heritage Trail website. So, and also our website, theperfect36.com. So people can buy the ebook, the audio book. But we donated the book to every school, library, and college in the state of Tennessee back in 99 and 2000. And so a lot of the librarians are still buying the ebook and the audiobook. And what's been so interesting with this pandemic is that a lot of people are going to the library websites and checking out the ebook. So we're, we're getting a lot of folks interested in this topic. And I also want to point out to you that in 1918 and 19, there was a flu pandemic. So the parallels with the suffrage movement 100 years ago and today 
we have another pandemic. So this is going to affect the way people vote. So this is a good, that's a good lead in to, um, for, for those out there, you know, unfortunately, uh, Tennessee is rather low on the uh, numbers of people who turn out to vote um, in elections, in men and women. So I think it's really important for Tennesseans, especially to understand what went into, uh, especially women being able to vote. Why don't you tell us a little bit um, of the story? Everybody knows the ending, but how, how did Tennessee play a role in the 19th Amendment? This is such a great story. It is a story of democracy, persistence, perseverance. The United States Congress finally passed the 19th Amendment on June the 4th, 1919, and sent it to the states to ratify. It ended up with 35 states ratifying, but you need three quarters of the states to approve an amendment to the Constitution. So, Nine states had outright rejected it. Three states, Florida, Vermont, Connecticut, would not even consider it. That left Tennessee as the last state that could possibly ratify. And my wonderful friend, the late, great Carolyn Yellen, always said that the Tennessee women were the greatest politicians the world has ever seen because they won the right to vote without having it. They won the battle of hearts and minds. But we have to remember that the women across this state were so well organized that there were men in the General Assembly. And think about this. It took those men in 36 state legislatures who voted to willingly share power. I mean, it's just a remarkable achievement. So in Tennessee, because we were so well organized, the women across the state, Scott, this was really a statewide movement. Now, I grew up in Nashville, and I can tell you that people in Nashville really don't often think about the rest of the state, but it was a truly statewide movement, and I also want to suggest that it was because of West Tennessee that it passed in Nashville, and we have three very significant figures from West Tennessee. The first is Representative Joe Hanover from Memphis. He was an immigrant from Poland. And there was a large immigrant population in Memphis, in Binghampton in particular. And then in Gibson County, there was Representative Banks Turner, who was a farmer in Yorkville, educated at Vanderbilt, he was a lawyer. And then from Jackson, originally from Henderson, was Sue Shelton White, a major suffragist. So let's set the stage. They find out that Tennessee is going to be the last state to ratify that could possibly ratify. So the pressure is on. Sue Shelton White sends a telegram to Governor A.H. Roberts, who was kind of reluctant. He wanted to see what happened with his party primary. So after he won his party primary, he conveniently calls a special session. There was pressure from both the Republican and the Democratic nominees for president in 1920 because they wanted Tennessee to ratify because each party thought that women would vote for them. Now, remember, we didn't have universal suffrage in this country until the ratification of the 19th Amendment, but we did have some states that allowed for partial suffrage, and Tennessee had actually passed that law on April 14, 1919, that allowed for women to vote for presidential electors and in municipal elections only, and this was part of Carrie Chapman Catt's winning plan to get the states to buy into limited suffrage so that their federal legislators would then support the 19th Amendment. So Tennessee had limited suffrage, which Representative Joe Hanover supported, and Governor Roberts supported and he signed the law. Well, then it comes time for the actual vote. And this was beginning on August 9th, 1920, when they went into special session. And in our book, The Perfect 36, Tennessee Delivers Women's Suffrage, we have some great quotations. And one of the political reporters in Nashville at that time said that the, the uh, Battle of Nashville, meaning during the Civil War, was a five o'clock tea compared to this one. <laughs> so it was a really vicious fight. And Carol Lynn had told the story in American Heritage Magazine in December of 78, and then 
she took all of the material that had been cut out and put it in the book. And our co-author was Dr. Jan Sherman, who came to Memphis in 1994. And then in 1995, we celebrated the 75th anniversary. And thanks to Ben State Senator Steve Cohen, who's always been such a strong ally. And now he's my congressman. So we decided that we were going to get this book done to tell the story because Carolyn said this history must be preserved and people need to understand how it happened, how Tennessee became the pivotal state. So they went into the special session and Representative Hanover had run for office because he could not understand why his mother couldn't vote. He was an immigrant who became a naturalized citizen who revered the founding documents of this country, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. So Harry Chapman Camp, who came in from New York State, was so impressed with his zealousness that she asked him to be the floor leader. So Representative Hanover ended up keeping the pro-suffrage votes together. Throughout everything that happened during the special session, it came down to the final vote. It had passed the Senate overwhelmingly, 25 to 4. And Steve Cohen, who was a state senator when we did the book, said the Senate got it. So then it came down to the House. And Joe Hanover had to keep those pro suffrage votes together, but he knew the morning of August 18, 1920, that he was two votes short. And he didn't know where those other two votes were going to come from. Now, this is such a great suspenseful story. And, of course, Bill Haltom really tells a, a, a great rendition of it in Why Can't Mother Vote, his new book. And it's about Joseph Hanover and the unfinished business of democracy. So Mr. Joe, which is what we call him in Memphis, and I actually met Mr. Joe in 1983. He only died in 1984. Wow. I mean, I, this is really recent history. That's amazing. Mr. Joe was so interesting. And of course, a lot of his family is still in Memphis, Shelby County. So Mr. Joe knew that he was two votes short, but what he did not know was that the morning of August 18th, Representative Banks Turner from Gibson County was in Governor Roberts' office. And Governor Roberts was on the phone with the Democratic presidential nominee, Governor Cox from Ohio. And Governor Cox was pressuring Governor Roberts, please get Tennessee to pass, get, get them to ratify. So Banks Turner is sitting there, and Governor Roberts pointed to Banks Turner and said, I am sitting here looking at the man who can make this happen. So <laughs> Banks Turner, unbeknownst to anybody, goes back to the floor of the House, and there were the votes to table the motion, because the strategy of the antis was if they could table it, under the guise of waiting until they were in regular session come January of 1921. Then everybody, you know, all the fence centers and those who were scared to cast a vote could act like, oh no, we just want to pass this in regular session, which was malarkey. So Representative Franks Turner, when it came time to vote on tabling the motion, voted against tabling the motion. And Speaker Seth Walker from Lebanon was shocked, and he went over and tried to get him to change his mind. Well, Banks Turner held fast, so the motion deadlocked 48 to 48, which kept the motion alive. And then the next vote was the one that counted, the vote whether to ratify. And S Speaker Walker really thought that the 48-48 vote would, would remain in place, which meant that the amendment would die. But they didn't know that Harry Byrne from Nyota, Tennessee, over there between Knoxville and Chattanooga and East Tennessee, had received a letter from his mother. Their son, who ran and vote for suffrage, had been looking to see where you stood and haven't seen anything. Be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with the rat verification. You know, sign mom. So Harry did vote to table. But then when it came time to actually vote on ratification, he voted to ratify. He gave it the one vote majority of uh, the one vote difference, and then Speaker Walker changed his vote to be on the prevailing side so that then he could vote for reconsideration. So that's how it all played out that thanks to Banks Turner and Harry Byrne and Joe Hanover, they are the three suffrage heroes and all of the women across this state who fought valiantly 
made it possible for American women to vote in the presidential election of 1920. And we as Tennesseans should be so proud. And, and I honestly think um, a lot of people don't know that story. And it's such an exciting story. <clears throat> and you tell it so well. So I really am, am so excited that we got to hear that. Um, so you, um, you've been actually telling this story and, and trying to get people on board for a very, very long time. Um, and, and it is exciting to start to see things um, opening up. Um, I know that we now have um, a heritage trail that you've been really um, uh, a pivotal person in and also um, a trailblazers monument. Can you talk a little bit about those two initiatives? I want to hear about those initiatives, but then I also want to hear for, for people out there who are listening, who also ha get passions and get excited about things. You're somebody who actually made things happen. You've raised um, millions of dollars at this point to, to be able to see these dreams come, come alive. So I want to hear a little bit about that too, about what is the secret to actually making things happen. So tell us a little bit about that. We have to learn from our history. You look at the suffragists, and I also want to point out the correct term in the United States is suffragists. The British were the suffragettes. They were considered so radical that the Americans wanted to distinguish themselves. So in this country, both men and women who support the right to vote are suffragists. So Steve Cohen was the reason that we got public art in the Capitol. Prior to February of 1998, there was nothing in the Tennessee State Capitol building that depicted Tennessee's pivotal vote. So Steve made sure that we had the bar relief and we had a blind competition. He put me on the committee and we worked with the Tennessee Arts Commission. And we had a blind competition, which Alan LaFleur of Nashville won. So if you look on the back cover of our Perfect 36 book, you will see that barley that's hanging inside the Capitol. And Carol Lynn was able to see that because we unveiled it in February of 98. She died the following March of 99. So Dr. Sherman and I decided that we were going to get the book distributed and then a the Quest for more public art happened. So there were attempts and, and people interested in Knoxville. And in 2006, the Knoxville Women's Suffrage Memorial was unveiled. And Wanda Sobieski in Knoxville asked me who should represent West Tennessee. And I said Elizabeth Avery Merriweather because she was the first known suffragist to Tennessee and she was from Memphis. So we had the three grand divisions represented there. Then in 2010, a board was put together and we commissioned Alan LaFire to do the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Monument that is now in Centennial Park in Nashville. And that was unveiled in August of 2016. Well, Jackie Hellman from Jackson decided that they needed to have something honoring Sue Shelton White. So I was the her fiscal agent. Jackie chaired the committee and we put the statue of Sue Shelton White in front of Jackson City Hall. So it's on Main Street. And it's just a beautiful sculpture done by Wanda Stanford. Well, we decided that we would do a Memphis monument because in 2012, I was working in then city council member Jim Strickland's office. Jim is now the mayor of Memphis. So he told me in 2012, he wanted a Memphis suffrage monument. Well, I was stunned because I was working on Nashville's. <laughs> so we got Nashville done, we got Jackson done. Then Chattanooga decided, I consulted with their mayor and in Clarksville, they decided they wanted sculptures. So Clarksville is going to unveil theirs this August 2020. Chattanooga's working on theirs. The pandemic has slowed us down, but it has not halted any of the production. So Steve is the one who made me understand that public art is so important. Because honestly, Scott, when we're all gone, those monuments will be there telling the story about what happened in Tennessee. This was the greatest nonviolent revolution in the history of this country. And these people deserve to be remembered. So having public art, in addition to websites and books, and ebooks, audiobooks, that's important. And gosh, libraries are so important. I just want to say that people at Tennessee State Library and Archives and all the librarians in our state do the Lord's work. They are wonderful. And we are so fortunate to have great libraries. But for people to find out about this history, I encourage them to look at our heritage trail. You know, TN for Tennessee, TN woman. And see, at that time, W-O-M-A-N was considered plural and inclusive. 
So they refer to themselves as woman suffragists. And the six volume set of the history of woman suffrage, which I have, is wonderful. There are a lot of great books out there. And it's exciting that people are interested in this because it is about nonviolent revolution. It's about people who believed in something greater than themselves. They believed in democracy and the rule of law. And I'm just so pleased that we can continue to tell the story through the public art. How, how do you, um, how have you found is the best way to take uh, the passion that you have and all these facts? And for some people, history can be complicated. And how do you, how do you communicate all that to the general public in such a way that you can get them it, excited as well? Well, I get a lot of invitations to speak. In fact, I had 19 speaking gigs that have been postponed. We will not say canceled. We will say postponed. But, you know, the good news is history doesn't stop. And this is going to continue. And the National Women's History Alliance is encouraging people to continue the suffrage centennial celebrations through August of 2021. So that means we can get all this public art done. People are continuing to buy books, ebooks, and audiobooks. People are going, what's, what's it safe to travel? And people feel comfortable traveling. We will have all this art in public spaces. So people will be able to see it. Plus, there are a lot of great websites and museums are doing virtual tours. So we have an opportunity to tell the story. The pandemic will pass and the art will remain. Do you know, um, what are some of the... Uh celebrations and commemorations that are planned this is a huge um it's a huge anniversary and i know of course the pandemic you know has probably halted some of the plans but as you said you know a lot of planning still continues and you know we here at discovery park are, are working on our plans for that commemoration uh what are some of the things that you're aware of that people might find interesting well, I know Clarksville is planning an event, I think on August 12th, to unveil their statue, which is called Tennessee Triumph. And Chattanooga is still working on their monument, not sure when it will be ready. And Alan LaCroix is doing theirs. So Alan will have done two monuments in Knoxville. There's a second one of Feb and Sminger Byrne and Harry, Harry and his mom. And then Nashville's is going to be relocated closer to the Parthenon, and we tentatively have an event planned for August 18th, which is the date that it actually passed in the Tennessee legislature. Memphis's will probably be October, November. And, you know, we'll just wait and see what happens, because if you look at what happened in 1918 and 19, there was a second wave and a third wave. So I think the health departments and at Memphis our law school dean and the mayor will probably have to determine if there could be a public gathering. So we will have these, you know, if we have to delay it, that's fine. Or if we do a virtual event, that's fine. But just for people to understand what happened and that we are celebrating only 100 years. And think about this. Any woman who was born before August 18, 1920, was born without the right to vote. That makes this really significant. And Carolyn Yellen was born in March of 1920. So she was born without the right to vote. The Memphis Monument, is it the one that has um, a lot of other of the um, suffragists there as well as other people who've benefited from the right to vote? Yes, it's called Equality Trailblazers. And it, it's facing the Mississippi, right? Yeah, it's, this is actually, when I started on this, I was looking at the suffragists from Memphis. And, and, you know, again, West Tennessee, Memphis and Shelby County were so significant. I, I just don't think I can, can overstate that. It, it is so critical to understand who these people were because these were ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And so I talked with Jim Strickland, and we put together a great committee, and I told him, I wanted us to honor the suffragists as well as those unheralded folks whose careers were made possible by the suffragist victory. And that includes Representative Lois DeBerry, who served for 40 years and was the first female speaker pro temp. I adored Lois, and she was so important. She was known nationally and internationally, and she's not honored anywhere in this city. So I put her as a Tennessee trailblazer on the Nashville Monument, 
And then she's going to be sculpted on the Memphis Monument. So Alan LaFryer has sculpted six busts. And those six busts, in addition to the 14 glass panels, will have steel and glass panels and LED lighting. It's going to be a spectacular piece of public art. And it'll be on the law school side, facing the river. You know, that was the old post office, the mm -hmm. customs house. And it's been repurposed as the University of Memphis Law School. So you can stand there and look at the Mississippi River. And when it, it's lit up at night, it's just going to be so spectacular telling the story of who these people were, what they did, and why they matter. Because they believed in democracy and the rule of law. Um, I, I went through a phase where um, I loved trying to read uh, diaries and uh, uh, people who recorded in writing their lives in Memphis history. And one of the books that I actually read was by Elizabeth Avery Merriweather. Yep. And I noticed, you know, in some her and some of your references, she was a really interesting uh, person who spent time in Memphis. Who, who of all these people that you've been researching and that you've been uh, studying their lives, if someone were interested, who is who is your favorite person to suggest that they look for the writings of or more books about or, or more information? Well, I have to say that I, I'm, of course, partial to our book, Perfect 36, because it, I, it has all of the suffrage folks. And Bill Haltom's new book about Joe Hanover, Why Can't Mother Vote, it's just such a great book. And telling the story of an immigrant. And I just think that when you look at all the public art, all of the people depicted on these works, uh, of the monuments and the statues, and when you look at the Heritage Trail, each person has a story to tell, and each person comes from a different background. So it's really hard for me to say that I have a favorite. What I am promoting is that these people believed in democracy. The suffragists believed that democracy is not a spectator sport. So I think it's important for young people especially to look at folks who persevered and persisted in a cause Again, because they believed in something greater than themselves. They wanted democracy to work, and it was a nonviolent revolution. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't violence. There certainly was violence, but the suffragists didn't perpetrate it. They were able to hold fast to their ideal of a, quote, more perfect union, which is what we're about. This is a great experiment in democracy. And... Yes, they were racist. I mean, let's point that out. Of course they were racist. They were products of their time. I don't know why we expect them to be superior human beings. But there were a lot of people who understood that the right to vote was significant for our democracy to endure. So I just encourage people, you know, you can Google anything about suffrage, about Tennessee, and there are going to be so many efforts now to preserve this history because people understand how important it was. And I have to tell you, back in 1989 and 90, there just weren't that many people who really grasped it. And that's why it was so important when Steve Cohen wanted us to have this public art inside the Capitol. Oh, and I've got to tell you the story about how the Nashville one came to be. Governor Madeline Cannon, who's the former governor of Vermont, came to Nashville to speak. I think this was 2008. And she said to the two women who picked her up, please take me to see your monument to the suffragists. And they said, oh, Governor, we're so sorry. The state capitol building is closed. And because, you know, at that time, that's all that was around was that fire relief that Alan McGuire had sculpted. And she said, you Tennessee women should be ashamed. You should have something that is visible. So that's how the Nashville Monument came to be. And having it in Centennial Park, thanks to former Mayor Paul Dean, we put it in Centennial Park, and now it's out there for people to see. And I guarantee you, Scott, if you went there right now, there will be people reading the temporary signage, taking pictures, learning about who these women were. So we put five women on that monument, and they are of heroic scale, because Alan likes to deal with heroic scale. He did the Athena that's inside the Parthenon, and, you know, it's only 43 feet tall. So Alan decided when we picked the individuals to be on there, I wanted to make sure that we had Sue Shelton White from Jackson, Abby Crawford Milton from Chattanooga, and Dallas Dudley from Nashville, 
Frankie Pierce from Nashville. And I was really torn about having a figure from Memphis because we'd already put Elizabeth Avery Merriweather on the Knoxville statue. But we wanted this particular monument to have the women who were actually in Nashville fighting for ratification in 1920. Knoxville's is cross-generational. Ours is five women who are actually there. So I felt like since Carrie Chapman Camp was an honor anywhere in statuary, we put her on there. And of course, you know, there's a dearth of women in statuary. So that's another reason we're doing all these monuments. Don't you think this would make a great movie? Well, there are some. You know, there was Iron Jawed Angels that HBO did. Uh -huh. And... There's another movie that's going to be coming out based on Elaine Weiss's book, The Woman's Hour, and Elaine's a good friend, and she came to our Nashville unveiling and our Jackson unveiling, and she hopes to come from Memphis's. So we've got a lot of folks interested in this. I, I feel like the story is so compelling by itself. It doesn't need embellishment, and that was my only critique of our Jawed Angels on HBO was that they had to embellish a little bit. The story is fabulous without embellishment, but we've got an opportunity to make sure that people know this story with our art. And I've been interviewed by people from other countries who just think this is so cool that we're going to have this art. And of course, we've got the books, ebook, audiobook. So we really are going to make sure that this history is preserved. That's amazing. You know, from being in the museum business, you know, I'm sure the uh, state museum. Um, has artifacts and is telling story. Are there any exhibits that are planned that are specifically about this? Yes. Uh, my understanding is that the State Museum, see, they had planned to open their exhibit March 27th. You know, life kind of stopped as of March 13th. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the pandemic was declared. But that doesn't mean they haven't been working on it. So the State Museum is going to have an exhibit. Nashville is going to have an exhibit at the Parthenon. So there are a lot of folks that are going to be having exhibits. I think the East Tennessee Historical Society is planning something, and Clarksville is planning something. So we're going to have folks around the state who will be doing things because there were suffragists in every county in Tennessee, all 95 counties. And these women were relentless. But it's just remarkable when you think about how they didn't have long distances, we know it. They didn't have fax machines. They certainly didn't have social media. All they had were newspapers and letters, and they did it. They persevered until they achieved their goal. It's just such a great story. Well, and I can't help but draw the correlation between their work, you know, for the 19th Amendment and your work to make sure people don't forget about it and to remind people. So um, that's very much appreciated, you know, by all of us who have a passion for history as well. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I also want to take a real quick chance to ask you about planning the dinner for Margaret Thatcher. Oh, <laughs> that was so much fun. Let me tell you, back in 1991, I had a friend in Memphis who said, why don't we bring Margaret Thatcher to Memphis? So Alan Morgan, who was the former head of, of Morgan Keegan, was sitting in the little tea shop where I used to eat lunch every day. And Sue Hare Locke, who was on the Memphis Separate Monument Committee, said to me, go talk to Alan. He brought Margaret Thatcher to Memphis. And so when I was talking with him, I said, do you think I should try to bring her? We had to take her to Nashville because the Speaker's Bureau that she was with didn't want her to come back to Memphis the following year in 92. So we had to go to Nashville. So Alan said, yeah, you need to do it. She's great. So we worked with the Washington Speaker's Bureau. And we raised the money. And I'm just going to tell you, Scott, right now, I grew up in Nashville. I was in the newspaper business. I was stunned at the lack of support in the corporate world. The only corporation that gave us any money to bring her to Nashville was Grover. The rest of the money was raised from private individuals. And her son told her to come speak to us because we were the first women's group in the United States that invited her. And I was president of the Tennessee Women's Political Caucus back then, and then the national chapter of the National Association of Women's Business Owners, NABO. The two of us went in together, and I personally signed that contract. <laughs> I want to tell you, that was really heavy. But we did raise the money. We had over 600 people at a dinner at the Opryland Hotel. They had to sweep it for bugs and bombs. You know, the IRA had vowed to kill 
And so I had former Nashville Mayor Dick Fulton and his wife, Sandra, who was the former commissioner of tourism. And they were our honorary co-chairs. And we met her at the small Nashville airport, Berry Field, when she came in. And she was lovely. We had so much fun. Governor McWhorter was great. Everybody had a blast. And we were sitting at the head table. And she said to me, I want to see the conservatory. Well, you need to know that every minute was scripted. We could not deviate from the script. And so I turned to my co-chair and said, she wants to see the conservatory. And that wasn't on the itinerary. And so she told me, it was Carol. Carol Kennedy said to me, you tell her she's got to change her shoes. So I turned back to her and I said, Lady Thatcher, we would love for you to see the conservatory, but you're going to have to change your shoes. And she said, I can do that. So we had Scotland Yard, the State Department, all these people working with us. And I told the governor she wanted to go see the conservatory. So she ends up after the dinner was over, and we had a blast. I'm here to tell you, the people at Opry Land Hotel were wonderful. They had had Gorbachev and Reagan speak there, and they were ecstatic to have Margaret Thatcher. So it ended up being just a, a fantastic evening. She was great. And, of course, I have a, a personally autographed picture from yeah. Lady Thatcher, and she was wonderful. We really had a great time. I got to spend time with her privately because she had a guard with her at all times. And so we sat and talked with her. She had friends in Nashville who she had grown up with. Wow. And they didn't get to come, but we talked about them, and I told her about watching her on CNN. And she was just great. I mean, she was a really fun person, and she was so smart. She spoke without notes. She addressed every topic we asked her to, and she talked about the British suffragettes and the right to vote. So she was she was great. I was really sad when she died, but boy, what a legacy. She was really terrific. So all these projects that you're involved in, like that one and like all these other ones, I mean, the one thing they require the most is fundraising. So how, how in the world do you go about um, – what are some of the fundamentals? You obviously have been very successful at it. You know, what, what are some of the things you've done that you feel like work? It helps to have great friends who believe in your cause. You also can't be bashful. Here's the way I look at this. And, and I have to tell you, I went to a fundraising session in 1991 in Nashville led by Ted Welch. And at that time, Ted was one of the greatest fundraisers in the country. He raised tons of money for the Republican Party. And he said, you can't be bashful. You got to ask. Every no gets you closer to it. Yes. You don't take it personally. Because when you're raising money for something, whether it's a cause or a project, you have to realize that it doesn't appeal to everybody, but you find those people to whom it does appeal. And you have to be persistent. And this is the lesson that I have learned from studying the suffrage movement. If they had given up and decided, oh, it wasn't worth it, oh, you know, they get their feelings hurt. No. I believe that for those people who want something to happen, you talk about the, the benefit, you know, cost, ratio, all this kind of stuff. To whom does this appeal? And that's where you go. You find the people who care about this issue. And you just can't give up. And so my feeling's always been I had to raise money for the book, the ebook, the audiobook, all of this public art. But once people buy in to what it is that you're working on and then they want to give you money, then they become supporters of the cause and they can recommend other people. And I remember Ted saying, You just can't give up. You just keep asking and you keep asking and you keep asking. And you also ask for more than you think people can give, because you don't know what people can give. And you ask, and if they believe in your cause, they're gonna give what they feel comfortable giving. And so I, I try to detach, not take it personally when someone doesn't wanna give. Just let me tell you, Scott, this is how I feel about it. If you don't wanna support what I'm working on, because I don't work on anything that's not wonderful. These are things I believe in, and this public art is important. Getting that book, and then the ebook and the audio book read by Dr. Sherman, Getting all this done is important because I understand that when we're all gone, this will remain. And so if you want to be a part of this, you're going to give me the money because I have to file a one story. But you're also going to have an opportunity to participate in something that matters. These people did 
great things. Ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And I'll tell you the other thing about the public art, you get your name engraved in something. How many people get their names engraved in something that's going to last? And so I don't take it personally when somebody tells me, no, I think that they're stupid, but, you know, I don't tell them that. Mm -hmm. I just think that people who want to be a part of something get it. And that's how we make it happen. And it also helps to have people who are willing to help promote it. So in my case, I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of influential people who believe that this should happen. And I have got diverse public art, and I think that is so important now with Black Lives Matter. I'm going to make sure that these black women are remembered and recognized for what they contributed because we have got to understand that democracy is a continuing experiment. And what we're doing with everything related to the suffrage movement is preserving this history. I wonder if your years as a journalist contribute to you being able to be such a good storyteller. Because when you were telling the story a while ago, I mean, I, you almost literally took me back there. And I think that is really a big asset. Do, do you uh, feel the same way? Oh, well, thank you. I'm flattered. Well, I enjoy telling the story because I think it's so important. And I grew up in Nashville, and all I can remember in high school there may have been one or two sentences. American women were given the right vote, you know, which is inaccurate. But be because we have to provide context and understanding to this history and understanding why women and men were opposed to it. I get asked that a lot about the anti-arguments. And in our book, The Perfect 36, Jackson Baker at the Memphis Flyer gave us a great review and he said that he felt like our book really addressed the arguments of the antis because it's important to understand that political and social movements always have opposition. And Carolyn Yellen used to say that women go through life doing the two step, two steps forward, one step backward. And that's certainly what the suffragists encountered. So we are telling the continuing story of American democracy. The anniversary will soon be here. What, what do you have? Do you have some projects that you're thinking about after that? What, what's, what's next after that? Or are you just going to go to uh, the Bahamas? And just <laughs> <on> the <beach? laughs> well, I'm not going to get on an airplane anytime soon. <laughs> um, I feel like since the National Women's History Alliance has suggested that these separate celebrations continue, I'm going to continue to sell books, ebooks, and audiobooks to libraries and stores that, that are interested. And I'm also doing training for virtual speaking because, you know, if, if you don't want to travel, just think about the people that want to speak for, and, you know, we do it virtually. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us today. Um, and we're going to link to all um, of the information that we've been talking about. Um, and we're going to get some books to sell here at Discovery Park um, so that people can come here and, and pick up a copy. So um, I am uh, really grateful for all the work you're doing, and I can't wait to let people know about, about some of these things going on. So thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. You're just a great interviewer, and I am just so honored to have been part of this. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.